hello everyone so today is the 11th problem solving session for the course biochemistry the course instructor is professor swagata das gupta uh, from iit kharagpur and i'm shrija ghosh a pmrf from iit kanpur i'll be helping uh, you with any kind of assignment uh, any kind of problems that you are un encountering during solving the assignment questions so today's uh, session is all about bioenergetics so you know that for any uh, kind of life processes we need energy and from where are we going to get that energy we have to our body has certain mechanisms by which it produces energy so in schools uh, and in your early education you must have heard or you must have studied about mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell so what does it actually mean what ha actually happens in mitochondria we will all see today so uh, i'll be solving few questions related to bioenergetics and uh, feel free to ask any question or any doubt you have uh, so i'll start with the questions now so starting with the first question Identify the basis for the high energy of hydrolysis of ATP molecule. First statement is resonance stabilization of product. Second is electrostatic repulsion between the negatively charged oxygen atoms in the molecule. Third is high solvation energy of the product. So we have to identify the basis of high energy of hydrolysis of the ATP molecule. So how the ATP molecule uh, hydrolysis can generate such a high an amount of energy. Uh, anybody wants to answer this question? So why does, uh, what happens when uh, hydrolysis of ATP molecules occur? So what would be the product, uh, what product will we get? We will get basically ATP hydrolysis means so you know ATP is adenine triphosphate, right? So we have the adenine base attached to a ribose sugar and the ribose sugar is attached to 3 phosphates, right? So this is, so this is basically ATP. So hydrolysis of ATP means Hydrolysis of ATP means breakdown of these phosphodiester bonds, so release of the phosphate. So ATP, this is ATP, so it can get hydrolyzed into ADP, that is one phosphate is released. So PI is inorganic phosphate, so one phosphate is released and two phosphates are still attached. Okay, so that is one step of hydrolysis this can further get hydrolyzed this can further get hydrolyzed into AMP plus PI basically one more phosphate will get released out of this diphosphate and we will be left with monophosphate so this bond breaking this uh, when this bond breaks between two phosphates, it releases a high amount of energy, okay? And that energy is because of few reasons. So the correct answer to this question is all the three statements are the basis for this high energy. So when this bond is breaking, there is a resonance stabilization of the product. Which product? The phosphate that we are getting, this product, okay? I'll show you in a minute how the resonance stabilization is happening. Then electrostatic repulsion between negatively charged oxygen atoms in the molecule. What do you mean by that? So uh, you know phosphate is basically PO4 minus, right? So the O minus that we have, the O minus that we have here when three phosphates are attached together the O minus are very close to each other so there is a electrostatic repulsion both are negatively charged so there will be a repulsive force right 
लाइट चार्जेस रिपल रिपल ईच अदर सो पॉजिटिव विल रिपल पॉजिटिव पॉजिटिव विल अट्रैक्ट नेगेटिव सो नेगेटिव विल रिपल नेगेटिव सो देर विल बी अ रिपल्शन फोर्स हियर बिकॉज ऑफ दैट रिपल्शन ऑलरेडी दे आर रिपेलिंग ईच अदर सो दिस बॉन्ड ब्रेकिंग बिकम्स ईजियर बिकॉज ऑफ दिस रिपल्शन ओके बिकॉज ऑफ दिस रिपल्शन बिकॉज दीज आर टू नेगेटिवली चार्ज एटम्स क्लोज क्लोज the inner space close to each other so they are repelling each other because they are repelling each other the bond between the two phosphate ions is easier to break apart okay then the third is high solvation energy of the product so the products that we are getting they are high uh, they have a high solvation energy whenever we are taking atp in a solution in a uh, in the water as a solvent the atp will readily hydrolyze so the hydro uh, the solvation energy is very high for the products okay so what do we have we have resonance stabilization of the product so we'll see how so this is atp i told you this is the adenine this is the adenine so remember from nucleo uh, from the nucleic acid session we have discussed about the different nucleobases a t g c and u so from that adenine we had discussed this in uh, the vitamins class also it is involved in many cofactors uh, and prosthetic groups we will see in uh, further uh, subsequent slides how they are affecting so this is the adenine it is connected to the ribose sugar this is the ribose sugar and then three phosphates are attached so this is one phosphate this is the second phosphate and this is the third phosphate okay and when the hydrolysis is happening this bond between the phosphates are going to break okay the bonds between the phosphates are going to break so we have so this is atp so this part alone will be amp right so if i mark this part here this part alone will be amp because we have adenine we have the ribose and we have one phosphate so monophosphate so here we have the amp and then two phosphates one and two okay so basically if i number this one two and three so this is basically the first phosphate here is mentioned along with the amp molecule then 2 and then this is 3 okay when this is hydrolyzed that is the reaction with h2o hydrolysis means addition of uh, water molecule to the uh, to the substrate and the bond so basically the bond will break and water molecule will add to the remaining molecule so this is adp now this is adp so amp plus phosphate so adenine monophosphate plus one more phosphate makes it adenine diphosphate and this is the phosphate that has been released the third phosphate is released okay this phosphate is released now this is that phosphate and h plus so you see when the uh, hydrolysis is happening you see the intermediate that has formed with the water molecule the intermediate has a nice resonance stabilization here see the charge has been stabilized so the reson this resonance stabilization actually leads to high energy of atp hydrolysis so atp hydrolysis gives high amount of energy releases high amount of energy and that energy one of the reason behind that energy is this resonance stabilization this is resonance stabilization okay so resonance stabilization is happening between the like within the molecule in the intermediate during the hydrolysis of atp okay the second statement was the repulse uh, repulsive forces right the second statement is electrostatic repulsion between the negatively charged oxygen atom so here you see 
the oxygen atoms the negatively charged oxygen atoms are uh, closely spaced so there will be a ne repulsive force between these two negatively charged and these two negatively charged atoms because of these repulsion the bonds will like to break apart because this oxygen wants to move away from this oxygen so this bond will be easier to break because of this repulsion because of this uh, electrostatic repulsion okay so one reason is resonance stabilization another reason for high energy of atp hydrolysis is repulsion uh, electrostatic repulsion between the ox negatively charged oxygen atom the third reason is high solvation energy whenever we are uh, hydrolyzing this atp the products have a high solvation energy that means this is very likely to get solubilized in water and get hydrolyzed okay so we have three reasons resonance stabilization repulsion and high solvation energy okay this is clear to everyone so we have resonance stabilization of the product we saw how electrostatic repulsion between the negatively charged oxygen atoms in the molecule and high solvation energy of the product so all three state all three uh, uh, factors are the basis for the high energy of hydrolysis of atp molecule okay i hope this is clear so moving to the next question question number 2 a student proposes a probable enzyme kinetics wherein it is proposed that the half reactions are as follows a plus b goes to s plus y with the energy given as minus 31 kJ per mole and x plus y goes to b plus z with the energy delta g given as plus 14 point uh, plus 14 kJ per mole okay if the overall reaction for the same enzyme kinetics is given as a plus x goes to a s plus z calculate delta g for the coupled reaction and state whether the enzyme has energetically favorable reaction kinetics so we'll see what is happening here so we have two half reactions given a plus b is going to s plus y and then the y here is reacting with another reactant x to give b plus z so if we add these two reactions we will get this b and b will get cancelled out so if we add these two reactions what will happen this b and b will get cancelled out and y will get cancelled out with y and what are we left with we are left with a plus x okay a plus x gives s plus z okay so this these two reactions here are basically the half reaction for this so this reaction the reaction given below this reaction is called coupled reaction okay this reaction is called coupled reaction okay so this reaction here we call it coupled reaction and we have to calculate the delta g what is de delta g delta g is basically standard free energy standard free energy okay delta g is standard free energy we have to calculate the standard free energy of this coupled reaction and we have to state whether enzyme has an energetically favorable reaction kinetics so how do we say whether it has an energetically favorable reaction kinetics or not so here you see one reaction has the delta g value in negative and the other reaction is positive so any reaction any reaction if it has a negative delta g that means it is 
thermodynamically favorable it is energetically favorable so if a if a reaction has the standard free energy as negative that means it is spontaneous okay the reaction is said to be spontaneous okay the reaction is said to be spontaneous that means it is thermodynamically favorable okay the reaction is said to be thermodynamically favorable now what is happening if the reaction so that means the first half reaction is thermodynamically favorable but the second half reaction is positive that means this is not thermodynamically favorable right this is not going to happen spontaneous this needs energy to go forward but here both the reactions are happening simultaneously okay that's how we are getting this overall reaction so when both the reactions are happening simultaneously when two reactions occur simultaneously and gives rise to a coupled reaction the energy in that case gets added up the energy is additive so the energy for this coupled reaction will be the addition of the energy of the half reactions so basically if i have to calculate the energy for the for this coupled reaction i'll basically add minus 31 plus plus 14 okay and if you calculate this you will get the answer to be the ans what will be the answer if i have to calculate this we will get the answer to be minus 17 now if i am getting the answer in negative that means it is energetically favorable right so the correct answer here is option b minus 17 and the reaction is energetically favorable okay do you understand how did we solve it we are basically adding the uh standard free energy of the individual half reactions to get the standard free energy of the coupled reaction okay that is very simple now how to decide whether a uh, whether the reaction is favorable or not whether the reaction is going to move forward or not that mean if a, if the delta g is negative that means it will move forward so the delta g for this reaction a plus x going to s plus z this is coming to be negative that means this is going to move forward that means x and z will be produced in the reaction when a and x are being reacted okay but if i if the same thing if i give you now s plus z goes to a plus x at that time the delta g will reverse its sign so for this the delta g will be positive kilojoule per mole okay positive 17 and here we are getting negative 17 if i reverse this it will be positive 17 that means this reaction like the backward reaction is not energetically favorable okay the backward reaction will require more energy because the backward reaction because the reaction is supposed to go from a towards s okay do you understand this so that means whenever the delta g is negative we have a thermodynamically favorable reaction the reaction is going to be spontaneous that means the reaction is going to move towards the product it was going to move forward okay so you have and the delta g of the half reactions will be added together so if i have two half reactions one and two and if i write a coupled reaction this is nothing but a coupled reaction so this is this uh, the energy for the coupled reaction will be the addition of the individual energy of the half reaction okay i hope this is clear to everyone it's not very complicated you just have to add the energies of the half reactions to get the final energy 
and you have to take care of the sign whether it is a positive value or a negative value if it is a positive value it is not energetically favorable it is not thermodynamically favorable it is a non spontaneous reaction if it's a negative value it's a spontaneous reaction or we can say it is energetically favorable it will move forward i hope this is clear let's move to the next question question number 3 identify the correct statements regarding the given structure so here we have a structure let's uh, identify the correct statements regarding the structure so we have three statements here the first statement is it is an f1 atpase okay second statement is the given enzyme generally consists of five subunits and the third statement is the five subunit are generally in the uh, stoichiometric ratio of 3 alpha is to 3 beta is to 2 gamma is to 2 epsilon is to theta okay so we have to identify the correct statements out of these three so what would be the correct answer here anybody so what is this struct given structure this given structure is f1 atpa so the first statement is correct then the second statement the given enzyme generally consists of five subunits that is also a correct statement if you see in the structure here you can see the five subunits alpha beta gamma the is a delta behind this gamma which is not visible in the structure and then we have the epsilon thus however the stoichiometric ratio that is given it is not correct so the correct statements are 1 and 2 that is option a okay what is the correct stoichiometric ratio here the correct ratio is 3 alpha 3 beta 1 gamma 1 delta and 1 epsilon so we have Three alpha and three beta subunits alternatively at uh, al uh, arranged in an alternating manner. Then we have a gamma that acts as a shaft of shaft that is holding this alpha and beta rotating structures. Then we have the gamma uh, delta and epsilon units that are holding the complete structure. So if we see a top view of this, if you see a top view of uh, the structure if i put an eye here and look from top it will look like this okay so from this center part we'll have a shaft going downward okay going into the plane into the paper and we will have we will have six subunits so alpha beta alpha beta alpha beta so alternating six subunits so this wheel that i have made like this whole round structure that you see here with alpha and beta 3 alpha 3 beta structure this is a this is basically a rotating structure okay this is basically a rotating structure around this gamma shaft okay so the gamma is a shaft here and these structure can rotate around the shaft we'll see why it is rotating around the shaft and uh, where it is so it is a f1 atpa synthesis uh, atpase right that means it is a atp synthase what it does it helps in atp synthesis okay it helps in atp synthesis okay it helps in atp synthesis so from this uh, when this structure rotates and around the shaft and uh, protons are pumped out we will have atp synthesis from adp so adp 
will get attached to a phosphate unit to form ATP. So, this reaction will happen in this enzyme. So, this is a membrane protein. So, this part here, this part here, this is anchored in the membrane, in the mitochondrial membrane and this part here is towards the outside and the synthesis happens, a synthesis of ATP happens from ADP and PI. Okay, so we have, uh, just a second. Sorry. So, uh, we have here 5 subunits alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. Out of those 5 subunits, we have 3 alpha subunits, 3 beta subunits and 1 gamma, 1 delta and 1 epsilon. So, the uh, stoichiometric ratio for the whole enzyme is this. Okay. This is clear. So, this is this was F1 ATPase or we call it ATP synthase. We call it ATP synthase. ATP synthase. Okay, what is it doing? It is doing ATP synthesis. How it is doing? The reaction is given here. Okay. We'll move to the next question now. Question number four. The biochemical reaction A goes to B has a K equivalent of 1 under the physiological conditions. Which of the following best describes the delta G parameter for the scene? So, uh, we have a reaction A goes to B and we have to tell which of the following best describes the delta G parameter. So, I have told you what is delta G. What is delta G? Delta G is the standard free energy of a reaction. Okay. Now, we have the options here. Option A is delta G greater than 1. The reaction proceeds forward that is spontaneous. Option B shows here delta G is very very less than 1 and the reaction proceeds forward that is spontaneous. We have option C saying delta G is equal to 0 and the reaction has attained equilibrium. And option D, delta G is less than 1 and reaction does not proceed forward. So, just now I told you what is the delta G and what do we mean uh, by the positive and negative values of delta G. So, delta G was standard free energy of a reaction and uh, if we have a positive delta G that means the reaction does not proceed forward. If we have a negative delta G that means the reaction will proceed forward and the reaction will be known to be spontaneous. Okay, The word spontaneous here is given the reaction will proceed forward that is the reaction will be spontaneous. Now, if you see here, in the second option it is given it is less than 1. Okay. If we are saying it is less than 1, that means it could be between 0 to 1. That means it could be a positive value 2. So, if it is a positive value, then it cannot be spontaneous. Right. So, it is not very clear whether it is a negative value or not. Okay. So, that is why this option will be incorrect and first and th last option is incorrect that is very clear because in the first option the delta G is positive and so the reaction does not proceed forward. In the last option also again delta G is less than 1 so it can or cannot proceed forward we cannot say if it is less than 1 and if it is less than 0 also anything that is less than 1 can be less than 0 to so, if it is less than 0, then it will proceed forward. So, we, it is not very clear statement. The second statement is not very clear. The first statement is also not very clear. Now, if you look at delta G is equal to 0. So, we talked about the positive delta G values. We talked about the negative delta G values. 
what happens when the delta g is equal to 0 what do we mean by that like the energy of the reaction the net energy of the reaction is 0 what is happening there the reaction has attained equilibrium so if i have a reaction a going to b that means this reactant is getting converted into product it is it is a uh, it is a equilibration reaction so a is going to b and at the same time some amount of b is breaking down into a right but here when the reaction has attained equilibrium what do we mean by equilibrium equilibrium means rate of forward reaction will be equal to rate of reverse reaction right so rate of forward reaction will be equal to rate of reverse reaction what do we mean by that that means the uh, the energy that is required to make B from A is equal to the energy that is required for making A from B. Okay, Both the energies have been equated the rate of the reaction from uh, the rate by which B is being formed from A or A is being from, from B is equal. So, when the reaction rates are equal, when the reaction has attained equilibrium, at that time the net energy of the whole reaction will be 0. This is clear. This is very logical. If the reaction has a positive delta G, that means the reaction is going in this direction. The re forward reaction is not favorable. If the reaction has a negative delta G, that means the reaction is moving forward but if it is not moving either forward or backward if a reaction is not moving either forward or backward that means that means the reaction the energy is zero delta g has become zero that's why the reaction is neither going ahead nor going back okay the rate of reactions have been equated and if the reaction rate of reaction rate of forward reaction is equal to reverse reaction what do we call we call that we, what do we say we say that the reaction has attained equilibrium the reaction is in equilibrium okay this is clear so that means if the delta g is equal to 0 the reaction has attained equilibrium here all the other three options if the options were given in terms of less than zero or more than zero and the statements were written we would have considered those also so if i give you an option delta g less than zero that means the reaction is spontaneous if i tell you this this will be a correct statement delta g less than 0 that means delta g is negative if the delta g is negative that means reaction is spontaneous that is a correct statement okay if i tell you the delta g is more than 0 that means reaction is non spontaneous or reaction does not proceed forward that is also a correct statement but if you are calling it less than 1 or greater than 1 then there is a doubt that whether it is negative or positive it could be negative it could be positive too okay so that's why we cannot consider the other three options whereas for delta g is equal to zero this is very clear that if the delta g is zero that means the reaction has attained equilibrium okay so option c is the correct answer this is clear i hope this is clear this is very simple so you just have to understand what delta g means what is uh, by just looking at the value of delta G, you should be able to tell what the what is happening in the reaction. Okay. Okay. Let's move on to the next question now. Question number five. So we have a reaction shown here. The structure of flavin adenine dinucleotide 
derives from the vitamin uh, riboflavin is shown state whether it acts as an electron proton acceptor or donor so whether it is an electron acceptor electron donor or it is a proton acceptor proton donor that you have to tell let's see so here we have the flavin moiety shown so they have uh, we have not shown here the side chain so it could be a flavin adenine dinucleotide or it could be a flavin uh, flavin mononucleotide both can have this so this is basically the main group that is derived from riboflavin we have studied the structure of riboflavin and fad and fmn in the vitamin uh, session in the problem solving session where we discussed vitamin that was the ninth session so uh, you have to see what is happening in this reaction options are option a acts as an two acts as a two electron donor and two proton acceptor option b is it acts as a two electron and two proton acceptor option c is it acts as a two electron acceptor and two proton donor and option d is it acts as two electron and two proton donor so we have to see what is happening here so you see the uh, you see the reaction here if you look at the reaction here you see this is the iso alex uh, alexane ring system three rings joined together you look at these nitrogens this one and this one you see after reduction what is happening here reduction is happening right how do i know reduction is happening if you look at these nitrogens now protons have been added to these nitrogens that means a reduction reaction has been up, uh, has occurred so what happens what do we mean by oxidation oxidation means proton acceptor or electron donor okay addition of proton uh, sorry addition of electron is oxidation addition of proton is reduction right so if you look at those two nitrogens you see hi hydrogen uh, or we can say proton has been added to those two nitrogens that and how many protons are added two protons are added right so this molecule here is two proton acceptor okay two proton acceptor now how it is that accepting two protons by donating two electrons right sorry by accepting two electron so here you see it is accepting two electrons and two protons right it the reduction reaction is happening so this will be if i have to write it we will have a flavin plus two proton plus two electron will give us flavin dihydrate okay so whenever we have fad it goes to fadh2 or if we have fmn it will go to fmnh2 right because two protons are added so it acts as a two electron and two proton acceptor okay so fad gets reduced to fadh2 so this is the oxidized form this is the oxidized form and this is the reduced form okay so here you can see the fad redox reaction so we have this uh flavin this is the flavin the riboflavin part actually a second so this here is the riboflavin part
and if I consider till the first phosphate we will have FMN and if I consider a little more the whole molecule it will be FAD right. So, this is the oxidized form of FAD when it is accepting two electrons and two protons, two protons and two electrons, two protons are added here and it becomes FADH2. So, FAD plus two if protons and two electrons gives FADH2. This is clear? So, that means it acts as a electron and proton acceptor. Okay. Moving to the next question, question number 6. Here again we have a structure given. A student synthesizes the enzyme whose structure is shown above. Considering that A is the protein component and B is Fe2 plus state what the two components are commonly known as. Okay, we have to we have an enzyme whose structure is shown here. We have the protein component and the metal ion component the Fe2 plus now we have to say what the two components are known as. Option A, A is epoenzyme and B is prosthetic group. Option B, A is cofactor, B is prosthetic group. Option C, A is prosthetic group and B is epoenzyme. And option D, A is epoenzyme and B, uh, B is holoenzyme. Okay. So, we have here the protein component and the metal ion component. So, if I remove the metal ion component, this enzyme will be inactive, right? When the enzyme is inactive, without its, uh, uh, without its cofactor or the prosthetic group, that enzyme, without its prosthetic group or the cofactor, it is called the epoenzyme. So, here, the correct answer is option A. So, whenever we have this kind of enzyme with a metal ion center, those metal ion center act as a prosthetic group. So, without the metal ion center, the enzyme will not be able to catalyze the reaction. Okay. The enzyme will not be able to catalyze the reaction without this metal ion. So, without this metal ion, the protein component is known as epoenzyme. When we add the metal ion to it, the whole enzyme now is called holoenzyme. Okay, the complete enzyme is called holoenzyme and only this Fe2 plus, this B part, this is called the prosthetic group here. The metal ion is the prosthetic group here. Why the prosthetic group? Because it is tightly bound to the protein. Okay, prosthetic group is tightly bound to the protein. So, we have two things. We have a cofactor and a prosthetic group. Now, what is the difference between a cofactor and a prosthetic group? Cofactor is basically something that is loosely bound to the enzyme. It interacts with the enzyme but it is not bound to it okay interacts with the enzyme both of them help the enzyme to perform its function but difference between cofactor and prosthetic group is interacts with the enzyme loosely cofactor interacts with the enzyme loosely whereas prosthetic group is tightly bound to the enzyme okay tightly bound to the enzyme Okay, so this is the difference. So, here, here, since iron 
is tightly bound to the enzyme it is known as any metal ion is generally tightly bound to the enzyme so the metal ions are known as prosthetic groups now if i have a uh, nadh dependent enzyme though in those cases those nad molecules are called cofactors they are not tightly bound to the enzyme they just interact with the enzyme while catalyzing the reaction and the protein component is called the epoenzyme the complete thing the protein plus uh the prosthetic group so here a plus b will be called as holoenzyme okay so the correct answer is option a this is clear moving to the next question question number 7 in a biological system when a spontaneous reaction may drive a non spontaneous reaction energetically the process is known as a free energy changes of such reactions generally are b certain enzyme catalyzed reaction are interpreted as c one spontaneous and the other non spontaneous identify the terms of phrases marked as a b and c so what is a a is when a spontaneous reaction drives a non spontaneous reaction together so that is a what is that process called then the free energy changes of such reactions what is happening to these free energy changes of these reactions uh, that that we have to answer and the third thing that we have to answer is certain enzyme catalyzed reactions are interpreted as dash that is one spontaneous other non spontaneous so they are interpreted as what okay so the options are a is energy coupling b is subtractive and c is one half reaction option b a is free energy change of the reaction b is additive c is one half reaction option c A is energy coupling, B is subtractive, and C is two coupled half reaction. And option D, A is energy coupling, B is additive, and C is two coupled half reaction. So let's see what would be the correct answer to this. the correct answer is option b so in a biological system when a spontaneous reaction is driving a non spontaneous reaction so uh, we solved a question where we had two half reactions given and then uh, one was one was having a delta g value of negative and one was having a delta g value positive so i told you the negative delta g corresponds to a spontaneous reaction and a positive delta g value corresponds to a negative uh, sorry positive delta g value uh, corresponds to a non spontaneous reaction so when we are adding those two the energies get added up so uh, the free energy changes of such reaction generally are additive okay and the process of this coupling it is called energy coupling why because the energies are coupled energies are getting added together and finally even if one reaction is non spontaneous the other reaction generates enough energy to drive the non spontaneous reaction too okay along with it so basically the spontaneous reaction has high amount of energy that is helping the non spontaneous reaction to move forward okay and uh, these uh, half reactions are basically called two coupled half reactions so because they are coupled reaction and they are broken into two halves okay so this is an example so uh, we all uh, know that our body is metabolizing different uh, carbohydrates and sugars that we are eating right so the basic sugar that gets metabolized is glucose in our body and the first process that happens in such metabolism is called glycolysis we'll uh, study the study about the pathway in the next session maybe so 
uh, for now uh, there is a reaction in glycol cells the first reaction where the glucose gets phosphorylated okay so here you see the glucose getting phosphorylated to make glucose 6 phosphate now if you see the delta g value is positive that means this is non spontaneous this is non spontaneous okay there is another reaction that gets coupled with this reaction to drive this non spontaneous reaction that reaction is atp hydrolysis so in the first question itself we studied how atp hydrolysis has the high energy we studied how the atp hydrolysis is uh so favorable and so energetically favorable why it is so energetic now you can see the delta g value also it is highly negative that means it is very spontaneous right it has a very high energy okay so that's why it was so favorable and why why does it have such a high energy because of the reasons that we discussed in the first question where we studied about the resonance stabilization of the product we studied about the electrostatic repulsion between the negatively charged oxygen atoms and the high solvation energy of the product okay so atp hydrolysis has the has a very high energy and it can drive other reactions when coupled together so now you see atp hydrolysis is very spontaneous it has a negative value of 31 kJ per mole whereas phosphorylation of glucose it is very non spontaneous the phosphorylation of glucose is having a positive value of delta g positive value of delta g means it's a non spontaneous reaction the reaction cannot move forward the reaction cannot go from glucose to glucose 6 phosphate on its own it requires energy from where it is going to get this energy it is going to get this energy from this above reaction so this is the first reaction this is the second reaction these are two half reactions when these are coupled together we get the coupled reaction energy coupled reaction that is atp so now if i add this I, h2o will get cancelled out and pi will get cancelled out we will get atp plus glucose goes to adp plus glucose 6 phosphate now and what will happen to the energy energy will get added so if i add this plus this minus 31 plus 14 we will get minus 17 kJ per mole that is a negative value that means this reaction becomes spontaneous so you saw what is happening if i have to directly add a phosphate to glucose it is a very non spontaneous reaction the reaction is having a positive value but when i am adding another reaction that is non uh, that is spontaneous to this non spontaneous reaction what is happening the overall reaction that we are getting becomes spontaneous the overall reaction becomes energetically favorable now this reaction can move forward because it has enough energy to go forward okay earlier glucose did not have enough energy glu like glucose phosphorylation of glucose reaction was not having enough energy to move forward and make the product glucose 6 phosphate when it is coupled with atp hydrolysis that has all that already has a high amount of energy when this reaction is coupled with atp hydrolysis it becomes energetically favorable and it becomes spontaneous okay so basically in a biological system when a spontaneous reaction may drive a non spontaneous reaction energetically this process is known as energy coupling and free energy changes of such reactions are generally additive and certain enzyme catalyzed reactions are interpreted as two coupled half reactions in which one is spontaneous and the other one is non spontaneous reaction okay i hope this is clear moving to the next question question number 8 in a biological system electrons are transferred from one molecule that is the electron donor to the another 
that is electron acceptor in four different ways. First is oxidation of carbon compounds by utilization of dehydrogenases. Second is NAD linked dehydrogenases. Third is oxygenase reaction. So in a biological system the electrons are transferred from one molecule to another that is uh, electrons are transferred from the electron donor to the electron acceptor in, fo uh, in different ways. So we have to identify the mechanisms that are shown here. So first where we are talking about oxidation of carbon compounds by utilizing the dehydrogenases basically direct oxidation. Second is uh, via NAD where NAD will uh, act as the electron acceptor and the third is oxygenase reaction. So what is happening in all three, what is the mechanism of all three uh, processes? Options are option A says first is hydride transfer, second is hydrogen atom transfer and third is direct reaction with oxygen. Option B is first is hydrogen atom transfer, second is direct reaction with oxygen, third is hydride transfer. Option C is uh, first is direct ox uh, reaction with oxygen, second is hydride transfer and third is hydrogen atom transfer. And option D is hydrogen atom transfer, hydride transfer and direct reaction with oxygen. So what would be the correct answer here? The correct answer would be, so what is happening in the first case, oxygen of uh, oxidation of carbon compounds by utilization of dehydrogenation, there we are having hydrogen atom transfer, okay. Then in the second case where we have NAD linked dehydrogenases, we are having a hydride transfer. What is hydride? Hydride is basically H minus ion. And third, where we have oxygenase reaction, we are having the direct reaction with oxygen. So all three are technically redox reaction, where electron acceptor and electron donors are elec uh, involved. So it, oxidation and reduction is happening. But the, the mechanisms are different. In one, we are having hydrogen atom transfer. In one, we are having hydride transfer. In the third, we are having direct reaction with oxygen so direct the electrons are directly uh, electrons are moved from one molecule to another with the help of oxygen so this is the three these are the three uh, mechanisms that are shown so the first one where the direct uh, oxidation of carbon compounds is happening by dehydrogenases so we have here succinate dehydrogenase. So you have here succinate. This is succinate and the reduction of succinate is happening. So here we have. So this is basically carbon. So we will have two hydrogens here and two hydrogens here. Right? This is CH2, CH2. Now when this reaction is happening, you see a cofactor called FAD. Now, what is this FAD doing? FAD is basically abstracting two hydrogens, accepting two hydrogens to become FADH2. We studied in the, when we were studying the flavin uh, reduction. So, this is basically that FAD redox reaction is happening. So, FAD from the oxidized form is getting reduced by accepting two protons so two if i remove two hydrogens from here and here so what will happen a double bond will come so now there is one hydrogen here and one hydrogen here okay so two hydrogens are donated to fadh2 so this is direct hydrogen atom transfer hydrogen atoms are transferred to the molecule what is happening in the second case Sorry. What is happening in the second case is we are having a hydride transfer. So we have NADH and NAD plus and we have lactate dehydrogenase as an example. So 
acids are NAD linked dehydrogenase. So, lactate is linked with NAD. So, NADH we have up uh, in the NADH molecule we have a proton that can be donated to the substrate. Here the substrate is pyruvate. Pyruvate is getting converted into lactate via lactate dehydrogenase. This is the enzyme. So, what is happening here? You see the NADH is getting converted to NAD plus. Okay. That means an H minus has been transferred. H minus has been transferred. That means NADH is basically NAD plus plus H minus. So, H minus has been transferred. This is nothing but hydride ion. So, you see the lone pair attacks here and then this is how the hydride is transferred here. So, when the hydride is transferred here and another proton is abstracted from the solvent system, we are having hydride ion transfer, hydride transfer by NAD linked dehydrogenases that is one of one example is lactate dehydrogenase. So, here we had succinate dehydrogenase and the second example we have lactate dehydrogenase. The third is direct reaction with oxygen that happens in case of oxygenases. So, what do oxygenases do? So, we have example catechol dioxygenase. So, this is a dioxygenase. So, it can add two uh, oxygen like it can uh, get oxidized in two positions in one go. So, it will have a direct uh, reaction with oxygen. So, O2 will basically add get added to both the carbon. So, this is COOH. So, it becomes COOH. Okay. Okay. So, this is direct reaction with oxygen by oxygenase. So, in, ox in case of oxygenase, the direct reaction happens with oxygen. In case of NAD linked dehydrogenases, hydride ion gets transferred and in case of other dehydrogenases, hydrogen atom gets transferred. I hope this is clear. Moving to the next question, question number 9. Identify the correct statements regarding the NAD plus FAD flavin nucleotide molecule. So, NAD plus FAD and F flavin nucleotide molecule. First statement is NAD plus is a coenzyme that reversibly binds to enzymes. Second statement is FAD is a prosthetic group that remains tightly bound to the enzyme active site. Third statement is flavin nucleotides are tightly bound to flavoproteins. Fourth statement is NAD is a cofactor derived from vitamin B6. And fifth statement is NAD and NADP are held very tightly by the enzyme site and cannot be utilized in reactions more than once. So, what would be the correct answer here? So, I told you the difference between coenzyme, cofactor and prosthetic groups. So, prosthetic groups are tightly bound whereas coenzymes and cofactors are reversible, uh, reversibly bind. So, the correct answer here is option C where the first, second and third statements are correct. So, NAD plus is a coenzyme that reversibly binds to the enzyme. FAD is a prosthetic group. Since it is a prosthetic group, it remains tightly bound to the enzyme active site. Flavin nucleotides again are tightly bound to flavoprotein because flavin nucleotides are a prosthetic group. Then comes NAD is a cofactor derived from vitamin B6. This is false because NAD is derived from vitamin B3 niacin. Okay, NAD is derived from vitamin B3 that is niacin. That is why we call it niacinamide. Or or nicotinamide. So, from niacin we get nicotine. So, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide that is NAD. And uh, what is flavin? Flavin is from where we are getting flavin? We are getting this from vitamin B2 that is riboflavin. 
that is the vitamin from which FAD and FMN are derived, right? Again, the fifth statement is wrong because it is reversibly bound. So, it is not tightly bound by the enzyme. Okay. So, option C for second and third statements are correct. Let us look at the next question, question number 10th. The depicted dimethyl isoaloxazine, uh, isoaloxazine ring system is known to confer certain degrees of planarity to a certain vitamin rendering it a yellow color. The vitamin in discussion is, so what is the vitamin shown here? We have a structure here that is depicting a dimethyl isoaloxazine ring system and it confers a certain degree of planarity to this vitamin and it gives it a yellow color. What is the structure shown here? Option A vitamin C, option B vitamin A, option C niacin or vitamin B3 and option D riboflavin or vitamin B2. So, what is the structure shown here? It is riboflavin or vitamin B2. So, you must, uh, we just now saw the structures of FAD in the previous question, uh, in one of the previous questions. So, this is the riboflavin, okay, vitamin B2, riboflavin or vitamin B2, this is the structure of riboflavin. From this only, if we attach a phosphate, we will get FMN. If we attach uh, we, if we attach a ribose sugar and a phosphate, we will get FMN. If we attach another uh, AMP molecule, we will get FAD, right? And this is the isoaloxazine ring system. So, this is dimethyl. These are two methyls grouped here. And this is the isoaloxazine ring system. Okay, and because of this ring system, it confers planarity to this molecule. These benzene benzene rings, benzene rings are planar in structure because of the bond conjugation, the alternating single and double bond, and it gives a planar structure to this molecule. Okay, it gives a planar conformation. Basically, it can sit on a plane. Okay, and also it gives a yellow color from where the yellow color is coming the yellow color is coming because of these two nitrogens so you know the lone pairs on the nitrogens are there so th that is conferring the yellow color to the molecule so these two nitrogens are going to give yellow color to the molecule so when uh, we have a flavin reduction so when this is reduced and two protons are added to these two nitrogens, the yellow color is faded off because now the nitrogen cannot impart that yellow color because now it is bound to the proton. Okay. So, that is how we have, we can actually detect a reduction reaction in the flavin molecule. Okay. So, flavin molecules are naturally yellow color in nature because of the nitrogens. But if those nitrogens are bound to protons, so that yellow color starts fading off because now the nitrogens cannot impart that yellow color, cannot absorb at that particular wavelength. Okay. The correct answer is riboflavin or vitamin B2. I hope this is clear. Moving on to the next question, question number 11. We have a reaction shown here. The given scheme shows the mechanism of an enzyme action. Name the enzyme. So, what is the mechanism showing here? We can see this molecule is getting broken off into two different products. What is the reaction happening? What kind of enzyme is doing this reaction? Options are option A oxidase, option B reductase, option C hydrolase and option D amylase. So, let us see here what is happening. What is this molecule? This molecule is a 
if you see this molecule is having a peptide bond right remember from the proteins uh, structure session we had studied about peptide bond what is the peptide bond peptide bond is basically co and h right the bond between the carboxylic group and the amino group of uh, two amino acids that is a peptide bond and this bond is getting this bond is breaking here by the addition of h2o this is what water by the addition of water so what do we call this any bond breaking by the addition of water what do we call it we call hydrolysis what is the reaction happening hydrolysis is happening why because by addition of water molecule we are breaking a substrate okay breaking of any bond by addition of water molecule is hydrolysis you saw in case of atp also atp was uh, water was adding to atp and we were getting atp hydrolysis right so similarly any kind of hydrolysis if water is getting added to the substrate and the bond is breaking this is hydrolysis so which enzyme will do the hydrolysis hydrolases will do the hydrolysis there is no oxidation here so addition of proton electron or uh, sorry add uh, sorry removal of protons or uh, addition of oxygen will uh, give, will be called as oxidation or reduction like reduction like whatever is happening based on that so if there is a proton acceptance and uh, reduction then if there is a proton uh, donation then that is oxidation similarly in those cases the enzymes will be oxidases or reductases amylase is an enzyme that uh, can break off starch molecules so it also does hydrolysis but it does the hydrolysis of starch molecule okay so hydrolases are enzymes that does general hydrolysis of these kind of peptide molecules so h2o is added to the bond and get breaks it basically so two hydrogens are added here one oxygen is added here okay so this is hydrolysis reaction the enzyme involved is hydrolase the correct answer is option c is this clear let's move on to the next question question number 12 which of the following electron carriers reduce two electrons in two consecutive steps so which of the following electron carriers can reduce two electrons in two consecutive steps so it can actually reduce one electron in one step and the next electron in another step okay so we have four electron carriers given here first is nadh second is fmn third is fad fourth is ubiquinone so which of the following electron carriers can reduce two electrons in two consecutive steps the correct answer here is ubiquinone we'll see so you know about nadh by now we are very clear about what nadh is doing what fad fmn are doing so nadh is the reduced form right so it can actually donate electrons and become oxidized in turn to form nad plus and that electron can move on to another uh, electron carrier similarly fad fad can carry electron it can take up electron and become fad h2 fmn can become fmn h2 so in all these cases two uh, electrons are either added or removed in one step 
but in case of ubiquinone what is happening in case of ubiquinone we can have the electron removal one by one so in case of ubiquinone one electron can be uh, removed to form a ub semiquinone and then another electron can be uh, sorry one electron can be added to become uh, uh, semi ubiquinone and then another electron can be added to become ubiquinol this is the complete oxidized form from ubiquinone it becomes ubiquinol ok two protons are added here one by one first this proton is added here and becomes a semi quinone then it becomes a ubiquinol in the second step when the second proton so this intermediate semi quinone is a radical ok this is a semi quinone radical so in this radical another proton is added and it becomes ubiquinol so two electrons uh, so one electron reduction is happening here and the second electron reduction is happening here so this molecule is very important because it can actually carry one electron if it wants to in case of NAD, FAD in those cases it can carry two electrons and it can donate two electrons or it can take up two electrons together it cannot take one electron first and the second electron later ok it has to take both the electrons together but in case of ubiquinone it can take one electron and then it can again take another electron in two steps ok so the oxidation is happening in two steps here whereas the oxidation is happening in one step here ok is this clear so ubiquinone becomes semi ubi uh, ub semiquinone and then it becomes ubiquinol so the intermediate is a radical form okay i hope this is clear to everyone let's move on to the next question that is question number 13 here we have a re, uh, reaction shown what is this molecule this molecule is a amino acid right if you remember the basic structure of amino acid you had a carbon to which a carboxylic group attached an amino group attached one hydrogen and a R group which can differ uh, in a broad range so this is a amino acid this amino acid is getting deaminated here. So, let us see what is happening. Given is the diagrammatic representation of the working of L amino acid oxidase. Identify amino acids amongst the following that cannot be determined by the stated enzyme. So, he, this is a reaction that is catalyzed by L amino acid oxidase. Okay, amino acid oxidase. So, this is an enzyme that will that is actually involved in amino acid metabolism. Okay, you are eating food, your food can contain some amino acid, some proteins you are eating. So, those proteins will have different amino acids. So, those amino acids have to be metabolized by your body, right? So, this enzyme is one of the enzyme that is involved in the amino acid metabolism. Okay. Now, during that metabolism step, what is it doing? It is oxidizing that amino acid. You see the FMN which is a prosthetic group here to this enzyme. This FMN is basically getting reduced to FMNH2. If FMN is getting reduced, that means the amino acid is getting in turn oxidized. So, FMN is taking the two protons out of the amino acid and making it a oxidized product. So, this is a deamin, this is also called a deamination of amino acid because the amino acid is getting deaminated the amino group is removed from the amino acid by 
the enzyme l amino acid oxidase now following we have four amino acids given p q r and s we have to tell which of the following amino acid cannot be determined by this enzyme l amino acid oxidase so this amino acid oxidase cannot uh, deaminate any uh, amino acid it can deaminate only few particular amino acids we'll see the reason why so among the four amino acids given here which two can uh, which of the following cannot be catalyzed by this enzyme so first tell me what are these amino acids here so we have this p which has the amino group the carboxylic group and the side chain ph2oh so what is p p is basically serine right we have studied the amino acid structure in one of the session first session uh, in one of the early sessions we studied the amino acid structure right so i told you to remember the side chain of the amino acid at least try to remember the side chains of the amino acid so ch2oh is the side chain for serine okay now what is the next amino acid here we have the side chain as this is the side chain what is this correspond to this is threonine okay this is threonine now the next amino acid ch2sh what is this this is cysteine this is cysteine right and the fourth amino acid here we have iso leucine okay now among these four amino acids these two amino acids serine and threonine you know are very hydrophilic right serine and threonine are very hydrophilic whereas these two are hydrophobic or cysteine is less hydrophilic so they are they come under hydrophobic category right so this amino acid uh oxidase this enzyme the uh, active site of the enzyme is very hydrophobic okay if the active site is lined with hydrophobic moieties which of the two amino acids do you think will fit in that pocket if the active site of the enzyme is hydrophobic then which two amino acids can fit in that pocket cysteine and isoleucine can fit in that pocket because they are also hydrophobic right so that means serine and threonine since they are very hydrophilic so they will repel that active site pocket right so that is why they cannot fit in that uh, enzyme pocket and that's why they cannot uh, be deaminated using this particular enzyme so the correct answer would be option a p and q that is serine and threonine so l amino acid oxidase does not deaminate serine threonine it also does not uh, deaminate basic and dicarboxylic acids so basically <coughs> basic amino acids and acidic amino acids they are also charged amino acid they are also hydrophilic so they can also they cannot fit in the active site of the enzyme the enzyme pocket okay so here we have p is serine q is threonine s r is uh, cysteine and s is isoleucine so cysteine and isoleucine can be catalyzed by the enzyme l amino acid oxidase whereas serine and threonine cannot get uh, deaminated because they are very hydrophilic and the active site of the enzyme is hydrophobic this is clear okay moving on to the next question question number 14 if electron transfer is tightly coupled mitochondria if electron transfer in tightly coupled mitochondria is blocked 
with antimycin A between cytochrome B and cytochrome C, then option A, ATP synthesis will continue, but P by O ratio will drop to 1. Option B, electron transfer from NADH will cease, but oxygen uptake will continue. Option C, all ATP synthesis will stop. And option D, electron transfer from succinate to oxygen will continue unabated. So what will happen if the electron transport chain is blocked between cytochrome B and cytochrome C? Then what will happen? Where is the cytochrome B and cytochrome C between the complex 3, right? In the complex 3. So we have complex 1, 2, 3 and 4 in the electron transport chain. And in that electron transport chain, if we block it at one position between cytochrome B and cytochrome C, what will happen? The correct answer is, all ATP synthesis will stop. Okay. So, this is this. This is the electron transport chain. So, you have four complexes. 1, 2, 3 and 4. Right. So, in the first complex, the electrons are transferred from NADH. Uh, this electron uh, is carried by a coenzyme Q and then it goes to cytochrome B and cytochrome C. So, here we have the cytochrome B in the complex 3 and it moves from cytochrome B to cytochrome C. So, that elect if I stop the chain here, so the blocking that we are talking about and with antimycin A, this here we are adding this antimycin, like antimycin A will act at this step. So, now this won't happen, the electron from complex 3 will not move to cytochrome C, cytochrome C will not get oxidized. What will happen if this step stops? If this step stops, there won't be any of this reaction and if this reaction is not happening, what will happen? There won't be enough amount of protons in the intermembrane space and if there are not enough amount of protons, there won't be any ATP synthesis. So, if I stop this, this will stop and then the proton transfer will stop. So, the proton pump will stop and there will not be any reaction from ADP to ATP. Sorry. Okay. So, this is the mitochondria and we have the different complexes embedded in the mitochondrial membrane which corresponds to the electron transport chain and this is the first complex where the two electrons are released and the second complex also two electrons are released these two four total four electrons are carried by coenzyme Q which is another electron carrier it takes it to cytochrome B then cytochrome C and it moves ahead to form uh, two basically perform this reaction. So, oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor. At the end, oxygen accepts the electron. And after oxygen accepts these electrons, we have enough amount of protons pumped in this intermembrane space and that proton drives this ATP synthase to form ATP, to form the energy we need. Okay. So, if we are blocking the electron transport chain between cytochrome B and C, we will have, we will not have any ATP synthesis. So, this is the reaction of the electron transport chain. So, we have NAD, uh, NADH going to NAD. So, this is the first reaction, complex 1, this is the complex 2. In both the reactions, we are having 2, 2 electrons released. Those electrons are carried by complex uh, uh, where we have the cytochrome, uh, where we have the coenzyme Q, then it goes to the cytochrome B. In the complex 3, we have cytochrome B, cytochrome C1. So, 
cytochrome B from cytochrome B it is going to cytochrome C1 from cytochrome C1 it is going to cytochrome A and cytochrome A3 that are parts of complex 3 and 4 and then finally we are having oxygen will accept those electrons and become H2O so this is the terminal electron acceptance it will get oxidized to H2 and enough amount of protein will be pumped out of the system in the intermembrane space for the ATP synthesis to occur ok so if we are blocking between these two 2 and 3 cytochrome B and cytochrome C right so if we are having a block here there won't be any ATP formation ok moving on to the next question question number 15 the relative concentration of ATP and ADP control or the cellular rates of glycolysis, oxidative phosphorylation, pyruvate oxidation and respiration. The relative concentrations of ATP and ADP control the cellular rates of glycolysis, oxidative phosphorylation, pyruvate oxidation and respiration. What would be the correct answer? Which of the four processes are controlled by concent different concentrations of ATP and ADP? So the processes are first, second and third that are glycolysis, oxidative phosphorylation and pyruvate oxidation. So respiration is actually the process that is not controlled by uh, relative concentrations of ATP and ADP. Rest all the other processes, glycolysis needs ATP, oxidative phosphorylation is making the ATP, oxidative phosphorylation is the process that we saw just now, the electron transport chain and then pyruvate oxidation that also requires ATP. So respiration except respiration all three processes are controlled by the different concentrations of ATP and ADP ok. I hope till now everything is clear if you have any doubt you can ask me in the chat box. Okay, so moving on to the next question, question number 16. In the cellular transport chain, sorry, in the electron transport chain, which one of the following can be a two electron carrier? So from the following electron carriers, we have to tell which one can carry two electrons in one go. So we have iron sulfur protein, cytochrome, cupro protein and flavin. So out of these four which can carry electrons, which can carry two electrons in the electron transport chain. What would be the correct answer? The correct answer would be flavin. So you remember FAD and FMN they can carry two electrons to become FADH2 or FMNH2 right it can get reduced by accepting two electrons right so iron sulfur protein cytochromes and cupro protein all can accept only one electron we will see how so this is iron sulfur cluster so any protein uh, like in, so in some protein that has iron as the metal ion center so that iron is coordinated with the sulfur of the cysteine uh, in that protein in that enzyme so this makes a iron sulfur cluster in that protein so it can be either with one iron or two irons uh, bridged with the two sulfur molecules so this will be Fe2S2 system the second one will be Fe2S2 system and the first is iron cluster where there is only one iron 
coordinated with 415 sulf uh, sulfurs of 415 okay so in the both of these cases we have this iron molecule so iron will be in ionic form e so this iron when it is in fe3 plus state it is the oxidized form right this is oxidized form and it can reduce it can accept one electron and get converted into fe2 plus that is reduced form right so it can accept one electron and get reduced similarly here in cytochrome also we have a heme derivative cytochromes are proteins that which have a heme derivative in the active site so he we have studied the structure of heme it is it has a porphyrin ring system where iron is coordinated with four nitrogens so this co coordinated iron again will be in fe3 plus state which can accept an electron to become fe2 plus right so both have iron which in which can undergo reversible one electron reduction so both since both of these in both of these cases one iron can accept only one electron it cannot go to fe plus state right iron can have two oxidation states three plus and two plus ferric and ferrous right so from the ferric state it will go to ferrous state or from the fe3 plus state it will go to fe2 plus state by accepting one electron similarly in case of cupro proteins we have copper so copper also has two electron uh, two oxidation states so copper can go from two plus to copper one plus so that means this is from cupric to cuprous okay so this is the oxidized form and this is the reduced form so it can accept an electron and become reduced to cu plus it <coughs> so both iron and copper can accept only one electron right whereas flavin now flavin has two nitrogens that can accept uh, two protons right so this is the oxidized flavin this is the reduced flavin so it can accept two electrons in one go and become reduced uh, get converted into reduced form so fad will become fadh2 or fmn will become fmnh2 right i hope this is clear basically out of these four iron sulfur cytochrome which also has iron and cupro proteins which has copper they can accept only one electron and get reduced whereas flavins can accept two electrons so flavin can carry two electrons whereas these can carry only one electron okay I hope that is clear. Now moving on to the next question, question number 17. Given the standard free energy chain delta G for the hydrolysis of ATP is minus 7.3 kilocalorie per mole and that of hydrolysis of glucose 6-phosphate is minus 3.3 kilocalorie per mole, what is the delta G for phosphorylation of glucose using ATP? So we have the delta G values for two reactions given here, ATP hydrolysis and glucose 6-phosphate hydrolysis. So let's see how to solve this question. So this is based on that energy coupling that I have already discussed. So we will have two half reactions and when we can, uh, when if we can have two half reactions and adding those reactions, we can get a coupled reaction, the energy will get added up. So, uh, we have ATP hydrolysis given as minus 7.3 kilocalorie per mole. 
so this is atp plus h2o gives adp plus pi and glucose 6 phosphate hydrolysis given as glucose 6 phosphate plus h2o gives glucose plus pi okay now the coupled reaction that is happening is atp plus glucose goes to adp plus glucose 6 phosphate right because we need the phosphorylation of glucose because in the question we have been asked what is the delta g for the phosphorylation of glucose using atp so using atp so atp plus glucose is going to glucose 6 phosphate plus adp so half what are the half reactions for this half reaction is atp plus h2o is adp plus pi for that we already have the energy as minus 7.3 kilocal the second half reaction is glucose plus pi goes to glucose 6 phosphate plus h2o for this reaction the energy will be positive 3.3 why because for the reverse reaction here you see glucose 6 phosphate going to glucose the energy is minus 3.3 so for the reverse reaction that is glucose to glucose 6 phosphate this would be plus 3.3 okay this is clear so if it is plus 3.3 that means now how we how do we write the total energy total energy will be added uh, addition of the two so that is minus 7.3 plus plus 3.3 so that will be minus 4 kilocalories so now one spontaneous and one non-spontaneous reaction together makes a spontaneous reaction with minus 4 kilocalorie per mole energy delta g that is the standard free energy change okay so the reaction can move forward and glucose 6 phosphate can form from glucose so the correct answer is option c here minus 4 kilocalorie per mole okay so this is simple so we have already discussed how to solve these questions so this is based on that only so different kinds of uh, numericals can be designed uh, based on this concept so you should be familiar with such questions okay. moving on to the next question question number 18 the regulation of oxidative phosphorylation depends on dash the regulation of oxidative phosphorylation depends on dash option a magnitude of iron motive force option b magnitude of electron motive force and option c magnitude of proton motive force option d is none of the mentioned regulation of oxidative phosphorylation depends on what it depends on magnitude of proton motive force so option c is the correct answer so what is oxidative phosphorylation it is basically the process of atp synthesis where the electrons are transferred uh, between different electron carriers and because of that electron transfer there is a proton pumping that happens uh, and there is a proton gradient that forms between the uh, intermembrane space and the matrix so this is the mitochondria so you have uh, outer membrane and inner and an inner membrane it's a bimembrane structure so in this mitochondria you have a outer membrane which is a bilayered membrane we have studied the membrane structure right phospholipid bilayer so this is the polar head group and the non-polar tail fatty acid chain so this is the outer membrane then you have the inner membrane uh, and then you have the inner membrane here and the space between these two the space here this space is called intermembrane space okay and this intermembrane space is where all the reactions are happening so in the inner membrane these complexes are embedded and the electron transfer is happening and the protons are pumped to this intermembrane space and now because of this proton pumping what is happening there is a partial positive charge or a high proton concentration is present in the intermembrane space so the proton concentration here is high 
and proton concentration in the matrix is low because of that there will be a difference in the pH right so there is a gradient form here from high pH to low pH or high proton concentration to low proton concentration that is leading to a proton gradient now because of that proton gradient there is a proton motive force that is generated and protons can be pumped through this ATP synthase from the intermembrane space to the matrix and that can drive this ATP synthase to produce ATP from ADP. So this is the ATP synthase, I showed you the structure in the previous uh, slide also. So we have the alpha beta alternating unit we have the gamma shaft and delta and epsilon that is holding the whole structure. This is the part that is embedded in the membrane. The N side shows the negative side, the P side shows the positive side and the ATP synthesis is happening in this alpha beta part. So basically, So basically in this structure here you can see the alpha beta part is uh, towards the intermembrane space. The ATP synthesis is actually happening in the intermembrane space, okay. Sorry, in the matrix, I am sorry. The ATP synthesis is actually happening in the matrix. So alpha beta will be so the alpha beta alternating structure I showed you this is like this so alpha beta alpha beta alpha beta so this is towards the matrix and ATP synthesis is happening here and the proton since all the protons were pumped in the intermembrane space and we have high proton here these protons will be pumped to the towards the low proton so this is the p side this is the n side p is positive n is negative and protons will be pumped from the p to n side as shown here as shown here so protons are pumped from p to n side and this will cause a rotation of this shaft i told you this alpha beta alternating unit is attached anchored to a gamma shaft that can rotate in turn rotating these alpha and beta units and each alpha and beta unit has certain affinity so actually the synthesis happens in beta so each of the alternating beta unit has different affinity towards ATP ADP and both Okay, so one is having high affinity towards ATP, one is having high affinity towards ADP and one is having low affinity towards both. And every time protons are pumped, this rotates by 120 degrees, changing the conformation from this beta to this beta to that beta. Okay, so first this beta will be there where let us say it has high affinity to ADP, so substrate binding will occur. Then second beta will come after the rotation and it has higher affinity towards ATP so product formation will occur so product will form but it will not be released then the third conformation will come where the product will be released and again substrate binding will happen product formation will happen and product release will happen and that is how the process of ATP synthesis will go, go on so it is like a motor running okay it is like a motor running and who is running this motor the uh, motor is run by protons so that is why the proton motive force is running this ATP synthase ok it is basically the major force that is required for the oxidative phosphorylation for the energy generation in our body ok I hope this is clear ok. Moving to the last question of the session, 
where does oxidative phosphorylation takes place. So, we have discussed about the mitochondria structure. So, you saw how the oxidative phosphorylation is happening. So, where it is happening? Ribosome, inner membrane of mitochondria, outer membrane of mitochondria, cell membrane. So, it is happening in the inner membrane of mitochondria, right? It is happening in the inner membrane of mitochondria, that is option B. So, you saw in this figure here, we have this is the mitochondria. So, this is the mitochondria, and if we zoom in this area, so we have outer membrane, intermembrane space, and then inner membrane, and then the mat um, mitochondrial matrix. So, this is the mitochondrial matrix this is the inner membrane, this is the intermembrane space and this is the outer membrane. Okay? So, we have four components here matrix, inner membrane, intermembrane space and outer membrane. And where is the oxidative phosphorylation happening? All the proteins that are involved in oxidative phosphorylation are embedded in the inner membrane. Okay? They are embedded in the inner membrane. Where is the ATP synthesis happening? ATP synthesis is happening in the matrix of mitochondria. Where is the proton uh, high? Where where is the concentration of proton higher in the intermembrane space? Where it is lower in the matrix. The protons are pumped from the intermembrane space to the matrix for driving this ATP synthase. How it is driving? It is rotating the ATP synthase. So, that the alpha beta alternating units rotate by 120 degrees and each beta subunit has different affinities towards ADP and ATP and that is how we are synthesizing ATP in our body. Okay? So, the, all this process is happening in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Okay? Now, after this session you know why mitochondria is called the powerhouse of the cell. Right? So, this was the last question of the session. So, if you guys have any doubt, you can write in the chat box or we can have the discussion later. If there is no more doubt, so we can end this session now. Thank you everyone for joining. You can leave the call now. Thank you.